Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Resource Center for Public Sociology event series on racial equity, indigenous knowledges, and research ethics. Today, during Black History Month, uh, we are very pleased to welcome Professor Joseph Mensa, who will be introduced to you shortly. I'm Ann Kim, a faculty member in sociology and current director of the center. As this meeting is virtual and we are not all gathered in the same physical space, this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory on which you currently sit. If this is the case, kindly acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University, the RCPS, and the Department of Sociology. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tekoronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. With recent and ongoing events that challenge taken for granted beliefs that we have achieved universal civil rights and racial equity, particularly for Black and Indigenous peoples across Canada, we are focusing this year's events around the interrelated themes of racial equity, Indigenous knowledges, and research ethics. This country's official discourse as a multicultural nation belies the entrenched systemic and institutionalized Eurocentric ideology that persists in education, the justice system, labor markets and the economy, healthcare, research, and that structures our day-to-day -day lives and interactions. Public sociology has an important role to play in mapping such inequities and in confronting dominant ideas, assumptions, and practices in scholarship, and in everyday lives. With this aim, this year's RCPS talks join broader dialogues and calls to action. Um, upcoming events I'd like to announce are the methods clinics that are offered by the RCPS. Each month we offer workshops on various methods. The next one is in March, uh, which is full, um, is on institutional ethnography by Professor Eric Mikulowski. In April, Professor Nancy Mandel and a couple of sociology doctoral students, Jana Boris and Janice von Presuth, will facilitate one on coding qualitative data. And in May, the clinic will cover our programming and media data collection by Professors Carrie Wu and Muyang Li. And please contact the RCPS for more information. Finally, the sociology department's annual lecture is being held on February 25th at 5 p.m. Distinguished Emeritus Professor from UC Riverside, Mike Davis, will talk about Trump as vector, pandemic denialism, and the anti-lockdown revolt. Please note we are live streaming and recording on YouTube and linked on Facebook. This means that you and your background, uh, if you turn it on, will be visible to or be heard by others. So please keep your mics off and your videos off so that we can uh, maximize our bandwidth for Dr. Mensa's talk. Uh, Dr. Mensa will speak for about 50 minutes and we will follow his talk with questions via the chat function in Zoom. If possible, please direct your questions to me so we can keep it uh, well organized. We have a lot of uh, attendees at today's event. So today's event on social injustice, racism and the COVID-19 pandemic a precarious entanglement among Blacks in Canada is co-sponsored by the Harriet Tubman Institute at York University. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Gertrude Mianda, Director of the Tubman Institute and Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at York to tell us about the Institute and to introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Today's presentation is part of the celebration of Black History Month why celebrating it by having a conversation about the COVID-19. We know that COVID-19 can affect everyone regardless of gender, race, class, uh, ability, and so on. But it is, it, it, 
it is, uh, but the way COVID-19 affect marginalized people, mostly black people in Canada, bring us to the reality of systemic anti-black racism in Canada. That is why we can talk, we can talk about it dur during this year, Black History Month, because Black History Month is a time to look back in the past, to remember all the struggle that our ancestors went through and how they have they overcome. It is a moment to celebrate their achievements, to learn from them, to learn from their bravery in order to execute a better present and envision and create a better future. We celebrate it in one month, but I think it should be a task of every day. It is what we do in the Harriet Tubman Institute, the interdisciplinary center for research, both historical and contemporary on Africa and its global diasporas. The Harriet Tubman Institute mandate encompasses the study of pre contact cultures and histories of Africa, histories of slavery and colonialism. It focuses on the struggles in current lives of African people and diasporic communities to achieve social justice and to cover contemporary forms of exploitation. Today's presentation by Professor Mensa is in line with the mandate that Harriet Tubman Institute pursues. The Institute fosters debate among scholars, engages with the community, which is illustrated by our collaboration with the Resource Center for Public Sociology in the Department of Sociology to hold this conference today on the COVID-19. With that, I would like now to introduce our own Professor Joseph Mesa, a former deputy director of the Harriet Tubman Institute. Professor Mesa is a member of the new Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. He is former chair of the Department of Geography and former coordinator of International Development Studies Program at York University. His research focuses on issues of race and employment, African diaspora in Canada. Professor Mesa is a diaspora fellow, was a diaspora fellow at the University of Ghana's Center for Migration Studies. He's member of Codestria's College of Mentors for PhD students across Africa, and he is a facilitator for the Pan-African Doctoral Academy, sponsored by the Carnage Corporation of New York. Professor Mesha is a prolific scholar, best known among his publication is Black, Black Canadian History, Experience, and Social Condition, published in 2002 with, co with second edition in 2010. His, last, his latest book is Boomerang Ethics, How Racism Affects Us All. Please help me welcoming our own Professor Joseph Mesha. Hello, my sister. Can can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, please. Yes. Uh, my my co-host, I'll yes. urge you to admit the people who are coming because I cannot be admitting and then talking. Please, so take care of that for me, please. Okay. Um, because of some technical issues, we are slightly late. That is very unusual. So I won't delay. 
So first of all, let me thank the Tubman Institute and colleagues at the Department of Sociology, and of course, my own uh, Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York. There are colleagues joining us from the University of Ghana Center for Migration Studies. I presume some are joining us from Ghana Technology Institute at uh, GTUC in Ghana. It could be from Valley View. A, a whole bunch of people are joining us up around the globe. And in particular, I would like to acknowledge the help of my wife, Janet. I don't know whether Janet is somewhere there. My two daughters, both of whom are now in the US, Nicole and Cassandra, and my co-author, Chris. When you guys invited me to talk about this, Chris and I were, we were working on a paper of the same uh, of the same topic. So we've been meeting uh, regularly on Zoom to, to sharpen the argument. I will not belabor this uh, preliminary remarks. So I will zoom right to the point. Of course, don't let, forget my brother Johnny L from Vancouver, so, I mean, there are so many people now, obviously I cannot see also, please forgive me. Now, now, my presentation will come, no, no, no. My presentation will come in three parts with unequal length. The first part will be some theoretical backgrounding. Then I'll get into some empirical materials. And then the latter part, which will be a bit shorter, will be on ethics, basically moral issues. That is where I venture into issues of normative argument, what we have to do in the context of the, of the, of the COVID. Now, this first slide here, I'm just going to show you my objective, which is basically to talk about the racial dynamics of the COVID risk in Canada. My approach will be basically an effort to give you a snapshot of what is happening. The COVID, without saying, is a moving target. Things are changing constantly. We have this idea, many have this idea that maybe science is out there to give us definitive answers. But what I want to put across is that if you have things moving that fast, the idea of ascertaining definitive answers is not something we can expect. And indeed, if you deal with philosophy of science, people from uh, Thomas Kuhn, they talk about paradigm shift. Uh, Popper, Karl Popper, talk about conjectures and reputations. And so in a sense, science is not really about definitive answers. We keep on changing, we hypothesize, and then we change things. So that is what you should expect. So what I'm giving is basically a snapshot of what the state of affair is in Canada now, okay? In terms of my underlying promise, I want to put across the idea that racism, people very, very often dichotomize is a matter of black versus white. But I, will, I want to take it from the standpoint of it being a spectrum, okay? A spectrum of a hierarchy of racial distance. For the most part, blacks will be at the bottom. There are empirical studies to that effect. We will talk about that. I will also highlight the entanglement of race, class, and place. Okay, much of what I will present will deal with this type of entanglement. Now, there are instances where you are talking about something like uh, the NIMBY syndrome, or when people in a particular neighborhood would want, don't want a low income. Uh, people to come in there or black people to relocate there. They will, they will group and have meetings and organize and basically ward them off. There you can say that it is an inten intention. It is a conspiracy, a concerted effort. But what I want to put across is this. For the most part, when it comes to issues like the COVID, it is really not a concerted effort among say the majority or the white population to say, let's give the COVID to blacks. 
and let's no, that is not what it is. In fact, what, what exists is a situation where the COVID will feed into existing structures. Okay? Existing structures that are already there. So it is not a matter of intention, conspiracy, let's do it. No, there's existing structures that are there. For the most part, they were built when the society was basically more or less all white. Anyway, so blacks are coming in. So some of the structures have not changed. So the point I want to stress here is that you find a situation where blacks are more infected with the COVID or suffering more from the COVID. The leading causation has to do with what economists will call path dependence. Okay, so there is an established path there that the COVID will, will work through and then somehow affect the blacks. So it is not an individual or concerted conspiracy. Okay, let's give them no, it doesn't let's give the COVID to blacks or something like that. So that is what I would try to do. So that in fact will be my overarching argument. So let me read it from this slide. COVID-19 uses pre-existing structural inequities to create racially differentiated life chances to the detriment of blacks and other minorities. That is my central argument. So if you don't hear anything at all, that is my argument. It uses a pre-existing uh, path. In fact, this argument, Susan George will call it the fact that there is well view among the majority population. So they don't have to actually get into conspiracy because that is their well view. So that is how, what they, they, how they operate. In fact, some call this the historical inertia. In other words, what has been there historically and then it fits into that. So they, some will call it historical inertia. Okay, so it fits into that. So that is my basic argument. Now, let me just now Give you some, give you some notable iron ironies, paradoxes, or riddles. Okay, I consider myself as a dialectician, so I often like issues that have to do with counter counterintuitive argumentation, ironies, and paradoxes. First, we are all often talk, uh, uh, encouraged to think big. Think big. So if you are dealing with global uh, geopolitics, you have, you have GPS, you have satellite images, you have big tanks, uh, aircraft carriers. And by, if it is business, it's big Amazon, it's big uh, uh, Facebook, everything big. But what you will see is that this is a situation when we are thinking big, we also have to think very small. Why? Take a look at the COVID. The COVID is indeed 60 to 140 nanometers in diameter. 60 to 140 nanometers in diameter. If you, if you want, one nanometer is one billionth of a meter. One billionth of a meter. Without getting into complexities, take a sheet of paper right here. The width of it, the, uh, sorry, the, the thickness of the paper, you can divide it into thousand times, and that will be the COVID. Okay, those who actually gave us this picture that we all talk about, in fact, those who deal with medical art, a lady, a lady by the name of uh, Alisa Eckert, and Dan Hages, they actually gave us this drawing from the Center for. Uh, disease control but for the first time. But the medical artists there, they call it the beauty shot. Beauty shot. In other words, that is the shot of the vara particle. And that is the site. In fact, Farid Zakaria, analyzing the size of it, talk about the fact that, in fact, after this sentence, the period that you put after this sentence divided by 10,000 times. And that is indeed the size of the COVID. So what I'm trying to talk about first, that is the first irony. The second major irony is the fact that those who deal with math or chaos theory will talk, talk about the, butter, the butterfly effect. A butterfly flap its wing in, in Asia and that can cause the water patterns in Canada to change. Here, it is a bat effect. It's a simple bat. Chris Kamar got infected somebody in Asia, the one province we all know about, and by the time you, you, you realize 
the ramifications are all over the place. We can also talk about this irony. We live in a global system. The world is getting smaller. People talk about time and space compression, globalization, everybody intermingling, interconnected. But with the COVID, you see an increasing tilt towards nationalism. So you have increasing nationalism in the midst of globalization. What an irony. The next irony is a situation where all of a sudden, the minorities and the job they do, we call, it, we call them what? Essential work or essential workers. Meanwhile, their pay itself is in essential pay. So you have essential work, but in essential pay. People who are more or less disregarded at first, now everybody is uh, up in arms against, uh, basically whipping them up. Acknowledging the fact that these minorities who were doing the garbage, transportation, uh, courier services, or bus drivers, they are indeed now the essential worker. My argument here is simply the fact that maybe you have to start giving them essential, essential work. We can also talk about racism, the irony there. Racism essentially very often, especially in terms of speed, entails special division or division among the races. The extent to which we are more divided, it, gives, it forces us to be more interdependent. Now, all of a sudden, we are also divided by racism, but we are really realizing that if you don't depend on those who are doing the so-called essential jobs, we cannot survive. The next uh, irony is what, in the paper that just came out, I call the tripartite, tripartite COVID riddle. This is a situation where, when the COVID started, many of us believe it started in China, unfortunately. But in China, the Africans there were blamed for causing, basically there was a lot of discrimination against them. If you go to UK, you come to Canada, you go to US, in the Western countries, most of the people affected are Blacks and Africans. You go to Africa itself, the disease is not affecting many people. There lies the trapata riddle, maybe later on we can try to solve. Then finally this riddle, we talk about the effect. When the uh, COVID hit, many governments are finding ways to deal with it. For the most part in the West, our argument has been the Matthew effect. The Matthew effect it's a situation where if you go to the Bible, Matthew chapter 25, verse nine, uh, uh, verse, verse nine, it talks about the fact that those who have more, more will be given. And those who don't have, the little they have will be taken away from them. That is the Matthew effect. Many governments are doing that. In other words, they are giving most of the support to the companies who are big with the idea that maybe they will trickle down. So most of them, in fact, if there's the need, they will give the, the funding to the landlord instead of the tenant. So they give it to the big, uh, those who have it more is given to them because some argue that we cannot afford to lose the, those type of company. They are too big to lose. Okay, now, what I will argue in this uh, presentation is the principle, uh, the difference principle. A book by John Ross, 1971, a theory of justice. There, John Ross advocated that if you are going to distribute resources that are scarce, the main thing you have to do is distribute it in such a way that it goes to the advantage of those who are least favored. Okay, so in other words, turn the Matthew effect around and give it to the disadvantage. I think that is where you have to look into. Now, with that, let me just get into the entanglements of race, class, and space, okay? Here, the main argument I've made before is to the effect that race normally, we think in terms of structural terms in binary opposite, left, right, black, white, uh, developed, underdeveloped, that is what we mean by binary opposition, okay? But what the best way to conceptualize racial dynamics is in the form of a spectrum. It is not really, left, right, or what some will say, Manichaean separation. No, it's not like that. It is a spectrum. But my argument is that in this spectrum, for the most part, in fact, there are empirical evidence to that, in, even in Canada. So of social distances, they do surveys about people and how they want to relate to different people. Almost always the black population get to be the bottom of the hierarchy. 
So, so look at it as a hierarchy. It is not in direct opposition black versus white. By that same token, I'm not saying that all oh, white people are oppressed, oppressed people, or they are oppressors and black people are oppre uh, the oppressed. No, power goes everywhere. We learned that from Foucault, okay? Some white are oppressed, some black are oppressed. But generally speaking, at a level of generality, you can see that major power belongs to, to, to the white population. That is one argument. And of course, the idea of not thinking of them as opposite is that without the conception of black, our notion of white becomes meaningless and vice versa. Nobody can talk about race if you are talking about blacks without contrasting it against white. So in other words, there is some reciprocity in their meaning. I mean, the reader in their concept of difference talk about that. We learn about white or we learn about black by talking about what black is not. In other words, you know more about blackness when you contrast it with whiteness. You are black because you are not white. So we learn through the difference. Okay, so they interpenetrate. That is something you have to keep in mind. Then of course, you talk about racial uh, hierarchy. Now, an interesting dynamic in terms of theorization that you have to keep in mind is this idea of racial triangulation. It also boils down to that. Here, if you can see my slide, is the white population and is the black uh, population here. This was put forward by a political scientist, Claire Jean Kim, 1991. Uh, she, uh, she is at the University of California. Now, so you have superior here, inferior, foreigner, insider. The basic argument of this, this uh, uh, graphic is simply that. For the most part, with this triangulation, the white society will use the Asian population to be somehow in between the, the, themselves and the black. So therefore, the Asian population will serve as a buffer zone between blacks and white. In other words, they will be in the middle. So in terms of superiority, they will hold the Asian population to be superior to the black who are down here. But at the same time, when it comes to uh, civic participation, they will consider the Asian population as being a foreigner. So they are down here, foreigners. So Asian population will be a foreigner, uh, but the black population, especially in the, uh, in the US, will be an insider. That is why the, it is insider. So there is this, that, 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 this type of a hierarchy, triangulation going on. And in fact, some of the Asian population also take advantage of it and distance themselves from the white and uh, the black population so that they become closer to the, to the, to the white population to basically obviously gain more power. If you remember the Rodney King situation in, in LA, it turned out to be a, a tension between blacks and, uh, and Asians. Okay, these are some of the dynamics. So all I'm trying to say, there is always some hierarchy and inter interplay of this type of dynamics. Now, let's look at the main issue of the entanglement. The entanglement I'm talking about here is that of the COVID infestation the level of mortality among black is attributable to the racial dynamics feeding into it, spatial dynamic feed into it, class dynamic. In fact, you can add a gender, a whole bunch of sexuality, the whole bunch of things from the standpoint of intersectional theory. But my focus here will be the, these three, uh, three spheres, race, class, and uh, space they will entangle with each other to feed into the, the COVID infected infestation uh, of the black people. Now, let me just use these heuristics and talk more about this. Mind you, I'm not trying to say race and class are the same. Of course, they overlap. In fact, at times they are even coterminous, <laughs> very, very, very closely overlapping. But every race can be divided into many classes. Just as many class, some cla many classes can be divided into what many races. So there are differences, but they overlap. But for the most part, they play out in such a way that they intensify the street. Let me give you a thought of experiment of how this can basically intermingle and exacerbate the situation of a, uh, of, of people. Now, a thought experiment would be now if you want drive through the city of Toronto and go to any bus station you will find a situation where the bus station or even the bus will be a particular space. 
And because of the labor market segmentation going on, which is something I'll talk about, most of the people taking the bus now, you can try <laughs> and you will see, will be the minorities, okay? Most of them will be minorities. Now, at the same time, minorities, will inter that will be a race component, will also intersect with the class, which will be the poor minorities and class, and then the race will put them in that particular space. Let's take any campus here, let's say York University campus. The daytime, you will go there, you will find mostly white population, any of the Canadian states. In the evening, you go there, it turns around, it becomes mostly minority population. They are the one cleaning the offices and doing all those things. So they are class, of course, the lower end class uh, uh, minorities intersect with their minority status and then of course, put them in that particular time in place. You can talk this about a whole bunch of things, but it's, it basically intensify the conditions of people. Now, let's take the issue of uh, the neighborhood, the neighborhood effect. In other words, the emphasis on the, uh, the emphasis on the space, okay? When you have the space, so, Concentrated with poor people, poor minorities, geographer will say it intensified the neighborhood effect. Mostly the white will move out. Mostly the resources are scarce. The employment opportunities are not there. The, uh, in fact, crime become intensified. Insurance become higher in Toronto here. If you go to a place like Jane and Finch, you are buying insurance, of course, they ask for your address. The address will tie you to a particular place for the most part, the poor person there cannot afford. There are some who will actually use other people's address to do that. So it creates these conditions whereby healthcare facility, of course, we have insurance here, but are there facilities, pharmacies, doctors in those neighborhoods? No. So these conditions are the ones that the COVID will use as a path to create the intensification of COVID infection among the Black people. So that is where I talk about the path dependence. So nobody is going to say that, oh, you are the black or minority, go get the COVID. No, it's not like that. But the conditions are set there already. So it feeds into it. So by the time you realize the more or less a game theoretical framework going on, the, the black or the minority population will lose out, whereas the white and majority population will gain. For the most part, if it is a zero sum game, those, what we gain, what they gain is a, will be equivalent to what the minority population will lose in a zero sum environment. Okay. Now, let me now try to delve into some of the empirical. So, take this as an intro or theoretical grammar of a sort. So, now I'm just going to get into the empirical dimensions of the presentation. Okay. I will go slow here. And for the most part, we have about 200 people of different background. I will try to use very simple uh, illustrations here and there. Now, let's first take this. Those of you who are not in Canada, just so that you know that in Canada, the black population is the third largest when you talk about visible minority. The Canadian government used the designation visible minority. Uh, that one will include all the minority groups here listed, the South Asians, Chinese, Blacks, Filipino, Latin American, Arab, Southeast Asia, West Asian, Korean, Japan, and others. What is not listed here is our First Nation population. Normally, they collect data differently. They are given elevated status. So normally, they are not included into the visible one. Of course, if you remember, those of you who are coming from outside, before we started this presentation, we have to acknowledge that we are on Aboriginal land. If you remember, the, the, the first thing that we did was the acknowledgement of the land. That is something we do in Canada. So you give the Aboriginals elevated status. That is not to say that they, have, they don't have problems. They have a lot of uh, racial problems uh, to us. So, okay, but keep that in mind for the sake of this data. One thing to note is that, that the black population in Canada is the third largest. We are about 1.1 million across the whole of Canada. As of the 2016 census, there were 34 million Canadians, 1.1 of whom 
uh, obviously blacks. Now, let me, let me tease your mind here for a bit. Look at the list carefully. South Asian, Chinese, Black, Filipino, Latin American, Arab, Southeast Asia, West Asia, Korea, Japan. Now, one thing, if you, <laughs> if you pay attention, as a geographer, one thing that stands out to me, many may not notice this, is the fact that almost all the visible minority categorization have a reference to geographic space. South Asia, obviously, you are from South Asia. Chinese, from China. Filipino, from Philippines. Latin America, from Latin, uh, Latin, Latin America, obviously. Arab, for the Arabian Peninsula. South Asia, it is only black. That is normally set in just position with white. Black, obviously, has no reference to a particular geography. Black is just chromatic, it's color, just like white is color. So it is this type of thinking that sort of feed into the binary opposition of black versus white. Okay, that I was talking about. You can actually see that. Mm -hmm. So black, of course, why don't you maybe say African worker is very, very, very nebulous, very difficult to even pin it down. But the point I'm trying to draw your attention to is the fact that very often the black population is set as the binary opposite as the white. That is why if you look at it, there is no geographic reference per se. It's just black. And we know that is a chromatic reference point. Now, let's look at the next uh, graph, uh, the next chart. Here, the main sources of the black population, the immigrants, mostly, of course, will mostly come from Africa. So this one shows the African immigrant sources and, uh, and the uh, Caribbean immigrant sources. The point to stress here is that mostly the first is Morocco, Egypt, Algeria, Nigeria. I've actually highlighted Nigeria in blue, Ethiopia in blue, Kenya, Somalia, uh, Congo, uh, DR, and Ghana. Because these are where you can say those who are coming are predominantly black. Of course, Morocco, Egypt, Algeria, they normally would consider themselves as uh, Maghreb or mostly in geography, we tie them to the MENA, uh, the Middle East and North, Af North Africa. They don't consider for most of this racial discourse themselves black. Some will do, but many will not. Okay, South Africa is in a different coloration. Why? Because South Africa, you know, the majority there, uh, there is a large, majority is black, but there's a large population of white, most of whom are the ones who are coming to Canada. Okay, so these are the list of the leading sources of uh, African immigrants. Here too, you have the leading sources of the Caribbean, Jamaica, Haiti, for the most part, Haiti being French speaking, many of them will go to Montreal, just as Jamaica, many will come to Toronto and that type of dynamics. Okay, so now let's look at this slide here. This slide talk about occupational selection. We're talking about COVID, okay? So it has a lot to do with what type of job do you do if you want to uh, be uh, exposed to COVID or not. This is just a selection, but the point to stress here is this. You have a situation where if you pick up the management occupations, you can see the percentage for Canada as a whole is 11% of the people in labor force will be in the management occupation only 5.3% of black, okay? Visible minority as a whole is 8.7. Non-visible minority, in other words, the white population will be 11.6, way higher. Okay, so the point is straight, first and foremost is that most of the blacks are not in management position, and that should be clear. Turn around and look at the health occupation. You can see how blacks, are the leading, like 11.19% of the black population are in healthcare, okay? The total segment, uh, share for the Canadian population is only 6.8. In fact, it is almost double the total Canadian. So you can see how the black population will be more exposed. Even among the visible minority population, you see the uh, average for the visible minority population is 8% but the black population is 11.19%. So that is something to know. 
that would speak to the extent to which the black population is exposed. Those in education, their uh, social work, blacks are leading. If you come to sales service, the, uh, those who are dealing with sales, they have to go dealing with sales. The blacks are leading. Manufacturing, blacks are almost there. So generally, you can see that the black population is have a, a large exposure to the COVID. Now, let me just, that is just from the census. This is a recent data. And here I would like to acknowledge my good friend, Valerie Preston, uh, the Professor Valerie Preston. I don't know whether she's on the Zoom. She actually uh, uh, directed me to this particular uh, data. The whole of Canada, you have 21% of the Canadian workforce in what has been called the front line. And if you take the racialized population in each of the category, those who work in the grocery store, they are over. Healthcare, they are over. Electronic shopping and mail order, they are way over. Couriers, they are way over the 21. Warehousing, they are way over. Food. So it speaks to the fact that the black population, the minority population is far more exposed to the COVID, okay? And the data shows, okay? Let's move on to the next one. And of course here, I'm just trying to mix things up with some pictorials. Now, Jamaican migrant farm workers forced to sign COVID waiver. I followed this story and what I got to realize uh, what it speaks to was the fact that recently they were coming from Jamaica. To, they come regularly from Jamaica to work on Canadian farms. Okay, and when they were coming, the Jamaican government compelled them to sign a waiver to basically absorb the government from any, any loss that they may incur while in Canada regarding the COVID. So the signing is not Canadian government forcing them to sign. It was the Jamaican government forcing them to sign. Nonetheless, when they got to Canada, the government expected, the Canadian government expected them to be quarantined for two weeks. But guess what? Their employers were forcing them to work right away because people needed the food. Now, let me use this also to establish this point. If you take the farm as a space, okay, you have a situation where this particular space is preoccupied by what? Black people, that is race entanglement right there. And of course, the black people that are there are not the high income, it's the poor black people, class right there. So you have the entanglement of race, class, and space right there. How on earth do we have farm in Canada where it's only black people who have to work there and feed the Canadian population? Okay, this has been going on for centuries. So don't tell me there is no power dependence happening. Okay, why can't we grow our own food? What, has, what does it have to be that particular entanglement? So of course, these are some of the dynamics that it is not now that is creating the COVID, but it is a part there that is structural. And for the most part, these people, they sign the, they sign the waiver. Why? Because they are put in impossible situation. They are poor. They have to come, okay? They got here, whether they have to be quarantined or not quarantined, they, they, they don't care. They have to eat. They have to feed their family. They are poor. So they will do whatever it takes. So that is what I want to put across, the idea of people being put in impossible situation. Now, those of us who are teaching from home, we can afford to stay at home, but there are so many, as I talk about the bus situation, that are still compared to go out there. In fact, I will show you a videotape, in fact, not a videotape, a, a report that suggests that people who have COVID are still going to work. Why? They cannot afford to stay at home. Okay. Now, the next one, talking about the spectrum of minorities, here, you can see the spectrum. That is to show medical staff. These are healthcare workers, okay? They were actually raising funds. But the point to stress is that you can see a, a, a right shot, but it's basically all minorities, okay? Now you can see this one. It's also long-term care homes, and it's all minorities. But this one, they were advocating for the government to do some uh, commission of inquiry into people dying in this particular uh, place. And you can see it's all minorities, and their exposure is more or less constant. Now let's look at the next one. This is also another shot. 
in a nursing home. The, I follow this story and it has to be a situation where there is a program called Butterfly Program that is being implemented in, in UK and some Canadian nursing homes are trying to borrow the idea whereby you integrate people's emotional needs with their material needs and, 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 and basically help the elderly. Uh, most of whom have dementia and all those things. But the, the point is stress is that most of the snapshot, anywhere you look at when it has to do with the adult homes, it is the minorities that are working there. Okay, and of course we know the situation in these adult homes. So their exposure is very high. Let me just check my time here. No, I think, uh, yeah, I have, I have time. Now, let, let me zero into the city of Toronto. The city of, this is the map of Toronto, the city as one as distinguished from the metropolitan area. So that is to say that it's just the city. So the metropolitan area of Brampton, Scarborough, Mississauga is not part, it's just the city of Toronto. The city of Toronto normally is divided into 140 neighborhoods. And what I did with Chris in one of our publications is to try to identify what we can call black neighborhoods. As of the time of this estimation, 8% of the Toronto population were black, 8%. So what we did is that, okay, let's double that and see which neighborhood will have 16% of black. So we will call those neighborhood black neighborhood if the neighborhood out of the 140 neighborhood, if you have 16% black. In other words, the total black population in Toronto is 8%, but we are doubling the 8% to 16% to call those areas that have 16% uh, and over as black neighborhood. And of course, if you look at it, those who know Toronto, you will see that it is the Jamestown area, the Black Creek area, the Jane and Peach area, the Marvin area, and all those Eggleton area. And those are the black neighborhood, the names will come. Now, with that, Having identified what we call the black neighborhood, then you went into the city's data and basically draw, draw out the, the demographics. Now, so you have the neighborhood, the black neighborhoods listed. If you look at it carefully, the percentage black in some of these neighborhoods, Mount Dennis, if you cannot see it, is 57% black right here, Mount Dennis. Uh, Humber Line, 19%, Black Creek, 32% Black, okay? Now, what we found is a situation where the Blacks are, you tend to have more visible minority also there. So this column here shows the visible minority in those neighborhoods. So if you go to say uh, St. James here, the first one, the whole population, 86% of them are minorities, okay? If you can compare this with the city of Toronto on the whole, minorities in, F in the city of Toronto is 49%. But if you come here, that is why I'm just comparing here. If you come here, it is 86%. Humber line, 81%. Okay, so what you have here is 80, Marvin, 87%. So I don't know, but if you ask me, I would say to some extent, the city of Toronto is racially segregated. Many would not want to say that, but that is the empirical fact. Go to a place, you have 87% minorities. Place, 81% minority, 87% minority, whereas the minority population is only 49%. So that speaks to the fact that, in fact, you go to some area, it's only blacks and minorities there. That is one point to make. And when this happened, you are basically containing problems for the most part. What do you find? You find low parent, low parent families, single parent families, more. The average single parent family in Toronto is 21%. Each of these neighborhood single parenthood is high. In fact, some black single parenthood is 41%. Some 37% is over. There. So that is high. Now let's go to unemployment. At that point, unemployment rate for Toronto was 9%. But each of the neighborhood 15%, 13%, 14 13 14 So you can see that the minority populations are basically witnessing or 
uh, experiencing high unemployment rate. Low income, the percentage of Toronto that's low income is 19. You can look at each of these ones, 27%, 22%, so low income is concentrated there. Now, this is the beginning of how you are thinking about what I call the power dependence. So the conditions are already there for the COVID to exacerbate it. That's what I'm trying to put across. Let's move on to the next slide. Here, we're looking at housing. One of the main protocol of the COVID is the idea of social distance. Okay, so housing becomes very important. The density of the environment becomes very important. Toronto as a whole, the city of Toronto, this density is 4,300, right at the bottom here, 4,334 people per square kilometer of, of land. That is the density. Look at the black neighborhood. Whereas the city is 4,000, some of the black neighborhood, 7,000. 6,000, 6,000, 7,000. So the concentration, more or less, there is a lot of concentration of people. Ha household size, the Toronto average is 2.4, the ne black neighborhood is 2.8. The difference is not that much, but generally it's higher. Unsuitable housing, unsuitable housing, basically by the standard of Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation on suitable housing is housing that is overcrowded. In other words, there isn't enough bedrooms vis-a-vis -vis the number of people who are there, okay? The Toronto on suitable housing as a whole, Toronto City, is 12%. Look at the Black neighborhood, 30%, 22%, 26%. In other words, if the Toronto one is 12%, people who are overcrowded in, in their homes, the average for the black neighborhood is 21%, almost getting to double that. Now let's go to inadequate housing. Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation define inadequate housing as housing that is in need of major repairs. The total average of Toronto is 7.1. The average for the black neighborhood is 10.5%. Now, so I'm painting a picture of a situation of a structural condition that has concentrated poverty, disadvantaged condition among the minorities. That is where the COVID is using through the mechanism of power dependence to basically affect Blacks more. Okay, now let's move on to the COVID data itself. The COVID data, COVID cases in Black neighborhood. This is from the city of Toronto. Average COVID cases, the whole of the city of Toronto, COVID, the count, the count was 2,212, the city of Toronto. And per 100,000 of population was 1,077 per 100,000, okay? Now, look at the black neighborhood. If the, the average for Toronto is 1,077, some of the COVID cases in the black neighborhoods, 2,400, 2,200, 2,000, some in fact, Western is 3,300. Clear, there is no denying the empirical data suggests that blacks are being infected. This is a data from the city of Toronto. And I must say that whereas the total, um, the, the federal government is not collecting racially disaggregated data, the city of Toronto has recently started collecting such data. So we are able to assess that, okay. Now, let's see here. The same COVID data, if you map or graph it, this is the Toronto one here, uh, third from the right. Look at some cases here, you can see it's all over. The Toronto one is here. All the black neighborhoods are basically more or less way high. Let's look at the city in terms of the, the ethnicity or not a race per se, not the neighborhood, but the race, because we have the data. Now, the population of blacks in the city is here. The share of black, let me be specific here so that you understand the calculation that is going on. So the share of the black population as of the 20, the share of black population as of 2020 
was 9.28. Remember, I was talking about 8 point something way back in 2016. 2020 is 9.2. So the population of Toronto, we have 9.2% of the population of Toronto being black, okay? Now, 24% of those who have COVID are black in the city of Toronto. If you do odd ratio cal calculation, you have 2.5%. Nine. That is to say that Blacks are overrepresented in those who have covered 2.5 times by odd ratio. That's what it means. Okay, let's look at the white population here. The white population constitutes 49% of the to total population of Toronto. When it comes to COVID, 21%. So they are underrepresented by 0 0.4. They are if they are up to par, it will be one, but they are below one. That is all ratio estimation. They are not up to par. Blacks are over. Minority, in fact, if you have Latin America, it's slightly even over than black. Middle East, slightly over than black. So that is what's going on. If you have 100%, 100%, you divide it through is one. But the moment you are over one, that means you are overrepresented. The moment you are under one, that means you are under. That is the basic statistics of odd ratio. It can be far more complicated when you are doing things like logistics, but this is just a simple estimation. Now, this is a star scan result. I'll read this because I, I don't think I've read much so far. This is the data. I mean, if you don't want to take the estimation that I have I've, I've done, this is an estimation from Statistics Canada itself, no less authority than Statistics Canada. Across the world, COVID-19 has had a disproportionate effect among certain population subgroups. Past research pre the COVID-19 in Canada has shown that mortality rates vary by neighborhoods according to ethno, cultural, and socioeconomic characteristics. These results from this study, the study that they have done, illustrate these patterns also apply to COVID mortality rate. So Statistics Canada obviously agrees that it is affecting Blacks more. Now, let me now get to the last part of my presentation where I deal with some ethics. It's, I have 10 minutes and it's more than enough. Now, the basic argument that I'm trying to make is simply this. We talk about description here. Now we are moving on to some of the normative argument as to what to do. And I think it is always good to move on to some moral principles here and there. Now, for the most part, I think you can even start with the Nicomachean ethics. Aristotle, in this particular book, many will consider it to be perhaps the leading book of ethics, okay, ever written of ethics, the Nicomachean ethics. In that book, Aristotle argued that injustice occurs when equals are treated unequally, or when unequals are treated equally. Okay, so basically the whole argument is that if the blacks are basically down, the COVID uh, ideas to basically uh, cater for the COVID, the protocols, you have to pay attention to them differently because they are the ones suffering. You have to pay more attention to them. Now, Kant, in his categorical imperative, talk about the fact that if, if you should accept moral imperative or make a low moral guidance, only to the extent that you are prepared to make it a universal. In other words, do unto others what you want others to be to done to you. But perhaps the main point that I want to draw in terms of my ethical positioning will be from Amartya Sen and John Ross. Amartya Sen, in his recent book, in fact, I, I, I should, uh, the title there should be The Idea of Justice. The Idea of Justice. I think I have the book right here. The Idea of Justice. In this book, he talk about justice as freedom. Remember, this is 20, uh, 2009. In 1999, those of us in development, we know about TSN wrote about uh, the idea of development as freedom, really. So he is standing the same argument here to say that basically uh, justice is freedom. 
The main argument in this book is that it's not the freedom comes in opportunity. You have to have the opportunity to say to work or not to work. And also the process of it. Now, what we have in, in many advanced societies is a situation where the opportunity to work is there. But do you have any way out? You, are you free not to go to work or not to go to work? That is the issue at stake. You have a situation where many of these people are caught up in possible situations where the job opportunity is there, but the process of it entails actually existential threat to your own life, okay? So there is something there that we have to actually take care of. More importantly, John Ross, Justice as Fairness, and in the book, the, A Theory of Justice, he talks about the difference principle. John Ross, in this basic argument, was developing an argument. Uh, he, he was the one who talked about the veil of ignorance. If you want to be fair, you have to cover everybody's eye in the veil of ignorance so that you don't know who you are, whether you are black or white, and then start from there. And in most cases, the best way to go about is, is to treat, distribute resources that are scarce to the advantage of those who are marginalized, to the advantage of those who are disadvantaged, to the advantage of those who are, in this case, poor or who are not doing well. So in terms of dealing with the COVID, we've seen those who are not doing well. And my point in all this is that much of the protocols, much of the instrument initiative that the government is putting in place to sort of to resolve the COVID, we have to pay special attention to the minorities because that is where indeed the problem is. In our own book, Chris and I, Boomerang Ethics, we talk about how racism affects us all. We know that it may be affecting the Blacks, but the Blacks are acting, you have to remember, we are acting more or less as a canary in the coal mine. In the 1900s, any 1900, let me see, I think I have a canary in the coal mine picture here I can show. In the early 1900s, 1911, when coal miners were going to underground to mine, they all have a cage, most of them at least, will have a cage of a bed, the bed is called canary, okay? The bed will be in there and they will carry the bed underground. Okay, and they'll put it down there and they, they'll be talking to the bird and all those things. The purpose of the canary or the bird in the cage beside them is that when there is a carbon monoxide leak or deadly uh, or, uh, chemical that leaks underground, those days there were no electronic means of detecting carbon monoxide or any deadly chemical. It will kill the canary first. And the moment the canary, the canary is in distress or dies, then the coal miner will know that, oh, there is a leak, so let me get out, okay? So what I'm trying to say is that maybe it is affecting black now, but remember, it is a sign of an impending danger. And on that note, I'll end my presentation here, and I'll seek the questions. Thank you very much, and apologies for uh, all the technical issues that you face at first. I hope you enjoy. I've left a lot of time because I want to solicit a lot more questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mensa, for this very uh, informative um, and enlightening talk. Um, you know, we often hear that uh, COVID-19 doesn't discriminate, um, but we have to bear in mind that through the processes that you've talked about in terms of path dependence, that we, we've created the conditions such that um, black people and other racialized minorities are differentially affected. And I think that's a, a very important point. So thank you for that. Um, we can open it up to questions. We have a, a roughly 200 people. So I will ask you to keep your, just to keep it um, organized, your questions. If you can use the chat to type out your questions, um, either direct it to me or you can have it to everyone. And I will try to sort of maintain some uh, order in that and, and I will read out your questions, your name and your question. So uh, if you can sort of 
we appreciate all the thank yous very much, <laughs> but my chat window is very small. Uh, so if you can hold off on your thank yous, we all know that uh, we're very grateful to Dr. Mensa for, <laughs> for sharing his knowledge uh, and his, um, his research with us. Um, so uh, if we can leave the chat clear to questions, I'd appreciate it. And, um, and then we can engage with Dr. Mensa for the time that we have remaining. We have scheduled this event until one o'clock, but if Dr. Mensa is available to stay on a little bit longer, uh, and some of you would like to do so, um, you know, we can, we can stay on for another maybe 15 minutes um, to half an hour after. Okay, I see hands. So the difficulty, I can I can try to um, call on you uh, if you lift up a sort of tag or sort of uh, put up a reaction, um, but I won't be able to see everybody. So if possible, please put your question into the chat um, and I will try to get to uh, your questions because there are so many of you, I won't be able to see you vis visually. Um, Okay. Okay, we have a question from Leander. Do you foresee the racial dynamics changing post COVID given the role played by the visible minorities? You, you want me to take it on, right? One at a time, right? Yep, I can read up the questions in the chat. <laughs> I'll manage the questions and the order and uh, you'll give us your-, your Okay, your let me response. just take it on one at a time and we see how it goes. Yeah. Okay, that one, I will say, um, I can read that one from here. I think it's from Leander. Uh, yeah. Thanks Leander for uh, joining us from the Center for Migration Studies. Yeah, basically, you see, when there is crisis like this, there is opportunity for the government to be able to do things or for people to do things that they otherwise could, couldn't have. But can you imagine a situation where, for instance, at your the office and everybody is, is teaching online? I mean, whether you like it or not, nobody is gonna go through UFA or Union. No, you have to. Okay, so when a crisis like that, it, gives, it comes with some opportunities. And in this particular case, to the extent that we are now beginning to realize the essential nature of the job that the uh, minorities are doing. I think the consciousness of people will change and it will be, people will be very, very receptive to an uh, initiative to help minorities. Okay, and there, ha uh, there has been some movement with people even helping out. I mean, even the, the Super Bowl in the US, you can see them have given tickets to the whole, uh, the, the, the healthcare worker. People are beginning to recognize that, okay? And it's unfortunate that you have to come to crisis for people to know the value of uh, this type of uh, work. Mm. Okay, um, let's see. Um, Dr. Kwame Aduse, I don't, are you able to unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay. Hello, Prof. Hello. Yeah, good evening. I'm Dr. Kwame Aduse from Ghana. Oh, okay. And uh, thank you for, for your presentation. I would like to know who you think should be the priority people to receive the COVID vaccination. From your presentation, who do you think are the people who should be prioritized when it comes to the COVID vaccination? Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, uh, question. I think uh, there is the realization that um, people who are working in the healthcare sector will be, now will be prioritized. Let me put it this way. If you are not careful and you use race as the leading point line for the vaccine, there will be a backlash. Okay, it's not a good idea to say blacks or minority. No, that will be a backlash. So my suggestion to be very specific is for the society, and I think that is what's going on, to develop a form of social vulnerability index. Okay, so what extent are you vulnerable? So it can come to where do you live? 
what neighborhood, what is work, what work you, and they will develop this type of index. In other words, look at it from the standpoint of vulnerability, not the race. Don't use racial anger. But ultimately, if it is well done properly, it will come back to the racial minorities. But then you are not using the name race in the discussion because otherwise there will be a severe backlash. So you should go with the extent to which people are vulnerable. I mean, we can develop vulnerability indexes here and there. But mind you, there are situations where even the minorities, especially the blacks, who will even be hesitant to take the vaccine. Or again, going back to racism in medicine. We all know about the Tuskegee experiment where US yes. government, for instance, uh, infected blacks with syphilis. Uh, uh, they have syphilis and instead of treating them, no. Why? Because they wanted to see how far the disease can damage people. So they gave them placebo without treating them. They know in it, of course, with ethical. Uh, so there is these things. So, so there are a lot of minorities that are hesitant. If you give in to them, they will not take it. Okay, and that is obviously unfortunate. Okay, thank you. Uh, David Farang has a question. David, you have to unmute. Thank you, uh, my brother, Professor Joseph Winsner, for such an insightful uh, theoretical and empirical uh, presentation. This is the first time I've been able to, uh, for a long time, a presentation which integrates theoretical and perspective with empirical findings. And, I think from what I gather from your presentation, um, the key idea here is that COVID-19, uh, systemic racism predisposed Black Canadians to uh, COVID-19 infection. In other words, it's systematic, uh, systemic racism is that predisposed and it's tied in from your presentation that social determinants of health. In other words, the place where people live and work will actually uh, predispose them uh, to COVID-19 infection. And uh, interesting, you talk about this boomerang ethics. And from my understanding is if we don't address that issue, that systemic racism, which is predisposing black Indians to, to COVID-19 infection, then the boomerang ethics philosophy brings in idea, nice idea that that situation, the issues emerging out of COVID-19 will come back to hurt and affect all Canadians. Can you please uh, share light on this? How, in what ways will COVID-19, if it's not addressed within the black neighborhood or black community, will come back to hurt the entire Canadians? Yeah, um, th thank you, David. Um, for those of you who are not aware, this boomer, idea of boomerang ethics is the, the writing theme of this book. I normally like my work to be informed a lot by philosophy and moral issues uh, and dialectics. But the idea of boomerang is a boomerang, of course, is something, an uh, aboriginal game, you throw it and it comes back. So if we don't deal with this, I've talked about the canary in the coal mine already. But the point in all this is that, have a situation where, say, are a black person or minorities infected? as I've already said. In fact, the mayor of uh, Mississauga has come on uh, TV and talk about the fact that the government should give people sick leave to sit at home. You can't have them going to work when they are sick. Now, now under this condition, let's say the person is going to an adult home or going to an environment that they have to cook food for people. I mean, it's straightforward. They are just going to infect people. Okay, so that is a clear case of the boomerang ethics. You, the impact has a way of not helping only the minorities, but there is a recurve, recursivity whereby it turns back, okay, to affect the majority and indeed the society. And you can see so many examples, but the point is, in fact, even the COVID, in terms of them multiplying or in terms of them changing, as you know, the new versions coming up, the more you allow it to multiply in a particular population, the whole population get exposed and get more, they get more in danger. So the boomerang ethics actually speaks to this, to be frank. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. A uh, question from Thanushan. Do you think, and it's a question about residential patterns, do you think that cultural pressure is a reason for certain neighborhoods to have a higher percentage of visible minorities? For example, many people choose to live in neighborhoods that have similar physical features as them. Perfect. This is something we in urban social geography, we do all the time. The idea of special urban spatial concentration comes in two main angles. Some of them, it's initiated by the minorities themselves. They want to be close to their, their people. They want to be close to their ethnic shop. They want to be close to their cultural institution, their social capital, fine. But some is also imposed from outside, okay? Some is imposed from outside. So are the, is the two working together? How is it imposed? Canada, of course, you can buy a house anywhere, but it will not come through the angle of race per se that you don't want the black person to be here but we know that many of the blacks are poor. So if you live in a neighborhood, thereby we increase the size and the house price, or we say that this neighborhood, it has to be only 350,000 houses that are there. By implication, you are taking away the minority, okay? Mind you, you are not mentioning the fact that you don't want the black, but by you pushing the housing price of that particular neighborhood, you don't want a small or low income housing or social housing to be there. Okay, you are not mentioning race, but implicit in that is race. Okay, so all I'm saying is that some of it is uh, by the minorities themselves, but some of it too is processed by the outside, put in there. Okay, thank you. From Anthony, thank you, Professor Mensa. My question is, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic affected whites more than blacks to the extent that the whites were wondering why it was so. I am wondering if there is a shift as highlighted in the presentation. The, the COVID-19 is affecting? Uh, it says the COVID-19 pandemic affected whites more than blacks to the extent that whites were wondering why it was so. Um, I'm wondering if there is a shift as highlighted. So did, do you think it changed? Has the, the impact of COVID on different racial groups, has that changed over time? Okay, let me tell you, if you see a data and it's affecting white more than blacks or white more than minorities, pay closer attention to the data. It is a statistical uh, way. If you take the absolute numbers, okay, this happens all the time. The bulk of the Canadian population is white more than blacks. So if you take the absolute numbers, of course it's gonna be more than black, but make it into a ratio, proportionality, percentages. That is where you, for, that, that is where you, you see. So anybody who say more white have been affected will be looking at it in a, you are comparing apples of oranges because in absolute terms, there are more white. Okay, that's what you have to keep in mind. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, from Frank, how will you, will you relate well, how will you relate the spectrum to the distribution of the drugs to fight COVID? The spectrum to the... I think you, the, the racial spectrum, I think you've addressed yeah. that when you were talking about how yeah. it should be yeah. distributed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Rabiat from Rabiatu, um, based on the premise you created, one may assume that there are no other colors aside from black and white. Does that mean there are no mixed blends? So this is sort of the the sort of the black and white um, kind of spectrum uh, concept that you had shared with us. How is their mixed blend situation? Is it worse off or better than the blacks? So mixed race, okay. how do you factor in mixed race people? Okay, first of all, please let me, let me discount this misrepresentation of what I said. I was talking about racial hierarchy. I'm saying that very often people dichotomize it a black and white issue. And I'm saying it is not like that. I think I went through this a lot of points from the beginning, how white and black intermingle, interpenetrate, they are reciprocal, there is a racial hierarchy, it's a spectrum, I've talked about that. So I have not, that is one thing I have not done to dichotomize it black versus white, no, okay? So if you're talking about mixed race, it's in there, it is a hierarchy, it's a hierarchy. Please, the racial discuss that I'm having it's a continuum. Let me stress that. It's a con but for the most part, the black will be at the tail end and the white will be here, but it's a spectrum. It's never black white issue. Okay. okay. Thank you. This, this can position itself in between. 
Okay, from David, what do you hope to achieve with this research or project relative to policymakers and those who are still promoting racism in this COVID-19 pandemic era? Uh, the policy issues, I think um, I've already talked about the, the approaches that we have to take. Uh, the government has to be mindful of the racial dynamics that is going on. The uh, instruments that are coming. And I say again, this is a moving target. For the most part, if you are objective, the Canadian government has done well. They keep on changing the policy and improving it. That is what I said from the beginning. Science is not a single definitive answer. Things change in a pandemic situation, and variables are keep on changing. So the government is also changing things. For instance, you have think uh, if you are working from home, there's a thing that you can basically detect. $400 or something. Maybe with the next thing, the government can say, pay attention to the, those in essential work and allow them to maybe deduct even more. So these are some things that the, somebody looking at this research can put in place, okay? And give, so that you keep more appreciation, not just talking in symbolic terms, but materially. Say, take a task break for if you are an essential worker. That is something material and concrete that you can talk about. Mm. Okay, thank you. From Adolf, uh, how do we use path dependence to explain the upsurge in COVID-19 cases in Ghana? So thinking globally, given the fact that it's the well-to-do driving the numbers. Upset of pay, pay. Well to do it, that is driving the numbers. In Ghana. So how do we use the idea of path dependence to explain, I guess, COVID cases in other countries, for example, Ghana, given that, you know, maybe different groups that are um, affected. So in Ghana, I, uh, it appears that it's the more wealthy people who are. The dynamics in a place like that would be different. It could be a path dependent that has been created and that has to do with the fact that the, uh, uh, let me put it this way, the fact that the well to do are not subject to rules, okay? So they will set the rules that social distance and this, the path dependent there will be the fact that they set the rules and they don't follow it. And that has been going on. You have I've been to Ghana, they are driving in the, the, even the traffic, they don't obey traffic rules. So that path dependent, they set the rules and they don't obey it, will create a path dependent. That in a situation where you say, you are saying socially distant, but you yourself are not socially distant because the path dependent there has been the father, they are above the rules and that is what can be affecting them. Okay, from Theo Phyllis, um, aside from these challenges, has COVID given blacks and other racial minority groups um, any leverage over white people and other racial groups, be it social or economic? You know, has see, it given them any power in a sense then? It's not a deal of power per se, okay? But you see, what you have to keep in mind is that anybody who is racist, the more racist you are, the more dependent you are on the person you are discriminating against. That is, the, that is the irony and the paradox. If you are racist, you separate yourself, you separate yourself, you separate yourself. But meanwhile, take a situation like this. You have to bring in the minority to come farm. Okay, you have to bring this to this. You can't do it all. The society is such that you separate yourself, you do only a small part of what you need. So the more you separate yourself, you hate the others, you expose yourself to be more dependent on them. Okay, so that is the paradox. But by so the COVID will have the majority or those who have this type of racial animals think twice because they it will expose them to know the extent to which they are their basic existence depend on the minority. Okay, that is what will happen out of all this. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, question from John. If a health authority explicitly chooses not to collect race-based data, could that constitute a human rights violation uh, based on the Ch Canadian Charter or the UN conventions? There are argument on both sides. The main argument that people use why the uh, authority may not want to collect race-based data will be, will be the fact that people will be stigmatized, okay? People will be stigmatized. 
if the data shows that, okay, it's all blacks that are having it, by the time you realize it becomes a radio station, if it is not nuanced, the discussion is not nuanced properly, then the black person sit besides you in the bus, you think the person has COVID, you see. So it can be used to cut both ways. But another way to look at it is that if you don't collect the data, you don't have empirical base to solve the problem. Okay, so the point will be to collect the data and use some stringent confidentiality issues to see how the data is being used. But there are arguments to both sides. Okay, uh, question from Nanganwa. Um, is the ge non-geographical segregation of blacks and whites in Canada positive for Africans or not? And by extension, uh, I, I mean, the, I guess you, the, they mean the non-geographical um, a visible minority um, mm -hmm. categorization, positive for Africans or not, and by extension, is classification of people with biracial or multiracial parentage as black positive or negative? Uh, and finally, what is the contribution of differential group behaviors uh, in the observed differences versus society discrimination? Perhaps deal with the first part of the question. And <laughs> this is a very, very complex. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but very interesting. You see, Please take this uh, from uh, the discussion. Race is not real, okay? Race is not real. Biologically, there's one human race. So race, we say, is a social construction. In fact, if you take the black population, there are more differences within the black population than between the black population and the white population. Race is a socially constructed. So whether it's mixed race, uh, black race, Asian, white, it is all our own categorization. There is not a natural racial categorization. It is all made up. So therefore, if you are in South Africa, they will call you maybe colored or you are, you are, you are black. Or the same person will come to Canada, you may not qualify as such. Okay, go to Jamaica, if your skin color is, is a bit light, you are elevated, but you come here, if you have skin color elevated and you are black, you are black. Okay, so these are all, and of course, I'm teaching the course in Latin America. There are about 10 different categorizations, uh, the black versus Hispanic, Hispanic versus Spanish, Spanish versus this, and, and it's all mixed up. So these are creations that vary from place to place. If it is natural, it will not vary from place to place. So that tells you the fact that race is a socially constructed phenomenon. So as to uh, the dynamic of uh, half, half, uh, half black, half white, it all depends on the circumstance and the context. So unless you give me specific context, it's very difficult to speak to. But in any case, if you are not a majority white person, you are part of gradation whereby it depends on where you belong. And mind you, it is, oppression is not also only done on the axis of race. It is, or, or overlaps with the axis of what? Class. So it is, a black person can be the oppressor and a white person can be the oppressed. You know that, a gender male can be oppressing, male, female. So it is far more complicated than just a black, white uh, oppressed, no. So please keep that in mind. Um, I think this part is is um, an interesting piece. Um, it's going just going back to that question. Um, this sort of visible these visible minority categories as black, white, um, or non visible minority. How do you how do you think it affects Africans? Uh, Africans. Yeah, that construct that that social construction of blacks. You know, okay. and versus the, and the, and that in that non geographical sense that you mentioned. Okay, so now you see, <laughs> Anne, this is what makes it complicated. Yeah. Africans. Africans are not all black. So it depends first, how, how are you, what are you defining as African? Start from the North Africa, Egypt, uh, Morocco, Algeria, they don't even call themselves blacks. You come to South Africa, you have my, my, the Africans coming from there that are white. You go to even, you, you go, so it gets so complicated, but uh, if you're talking about black African, this is where the homogenization and heterogeneity within the system has to be taken. In fact, I have started writing, if you Google my writing, you see, I've started talking about black continental Africans as a category. Uh, 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 so in other words, I'm using this identity as form as black 
continental African, that will be different from a black person from the Caribbean, from the US or from, from Nova Scotia, the native black, okay? So I'm concentrating on that and dynamics. But the question that they are asking is a bit unclear to me, but in, uh, the, if a black person live in a segregated area, uh, to be frank, a segregated area in this environment is really not that good because it is a concentration of poverty conditions in most of those things. Okay, you saw the unemployment, you saw the overcrowding, you saw this, you saw that. Mm -hmm. So what you have is a situation, the school is no good, the stores are no good. In fact, in geography, you have what they call food desert, where you cannot even find fresh fruit to buy there because the big grocery stores are all in the suburbs. Okay, the hospitals are not there. The con it's all concrete. You don't even have a playing ground for your children. And it's all noise, it's all congested. So in actual fact, many people who really want to get out of or do, if I got people and I'm speaking to the African community, mostly they just have to get out of the concentrated areas. Okay, if you really want to move ahead. Because there you have a concentration of negative conditions. Right. Okay. Uh, it's 1.15. Are you okay to take a few more questions? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Okay. I'm, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> okay. Um, from Solomon, uh, to asking about the interplay between population density and COVID-19 incidents. How can the densely populated Black communities in Canada be protected? Yeah, of course. We are all asked to socially distance. That is one main protocol of this. So how can we uh, protect it. One uh, aspect of it, and I think even the Canadian government is beginning to look at those angles, is to build a specialized environment when if you are suspected of having the COVID or have it, then you move it out. Okay, so you take it out of the overcrowded place and you take that person out of that region to a specialized uh, facility. Those are some of the initiatives that you can do to protect the rest that are there. Okay. Okay, um, question from Doot um, around the labor market and how purchasing power. So on the labor market, you indicated most Blacks occupy influential positions. I'm not sure that that's what your data showed, um, but except for the managerial position. Well, how will it then affect their purchasing power, especially in the housing sector? Could it, be inherent, could it be the inherent return plans that they nurture? So they rather invest and or remit in origin countries so it affects their finances. The question is complicated, but I think I have an idea where the author, the, the questioner is going. Uh, obviously, I didn't say the black has higher income or anything. I didn't say that. Uh, right. But uh, generally, there is a literature that we call uh, transnational housing. I think one of the presenters, David Ferran, has a paper on it, transnational housing, whereby there is a lot of effort among uh, Africans uh, housing, uh, building houses back home. And of course, if you are engaged in housing back home, it will invariably undermine your capability to acquire housing here. So there will be that angle to it. Okay. So beyond that, I, I, the question itself was starting from somewhere that I, I, I think the person said I said, but that was not what I said. Right. Okay. Thank you. From Anthony, um, in terms of social protection, would you say um, that the Canadian government has policies for those in the minority or migrant workers to have access to social protection in terms of healthcare and unemployment benefits? I think now there is a lot of talk about uh, people, uh, the fact that the government has to pay attention to uh, work leave, leave uh, with pay uh, so that people who have sentence can basically stay at home. Uh, there is a move to take care of health, uh, child care or something like that. So there are, um, I think generally speaking, as the condition uh, become complicated and more data comes in, the government keep on shifting and adjusting the policies. So I think they are doing the best they can, but there's always room for imp improvement. The fact that those who are uh, doing essential work demand or deserve more attention, I think is seeping through. If you pay attention to the policies that are coming, many people are realizing that. 
Thank you. From Dr. Collins, um, some do not believe in the existence of the coronavirus. How do we disabuse their mind of such um, beliefs based on your work? Um, <laughs> I think you can do a simple experiment and expose them to it and see. <clears throat> uh, if that, they will believe it. Or, I mean, that would be a scientific experiment. If you don't believe it, <laughs> but that is obviously, I don't, I think to be frank, uh, they, we need more um, education. Education, to be educated, yep. I think more education, more education. It's unfortunate, uh, there is so it's much been... conspiracy going on. I don't know yeah. why the word conspiracy has even become so uh, strong. Brain. Yeah, yeah, people are doing things that are even going against their own benefit because of conspiracy theories, okay? There are so many things that are going against people and it's basically what you call, Marx will call false consciousness. They are doing things that, are, that is not in their own interest. And that is uh, something we have to do a lot of education. I hope. Yeah. Okay. Um... I'm just trying to go through to make sure we don't repeat questions that have already been asked. Um, okay, I think there's a, an important question about how, by Dr. Adomako, uh, how do we communicate the, your findings to black communities uh, and black people in Canada and other countries? Uh, and so you guys are the one who organizes. So you, <laughs> <laughs> you are the one who, I think you are going to put it on YouTube. And I think I made it in such a way that it will be applicable to so many communities. And uh, uh, so I will, I mean, I will, hire, I will be part of an, any effort to disseminate it. Uh, obviously that's what you do as intellectuals. Um, uh, anybody on it, if you want me to speak to it in any forum, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I think this uh, information is uh, important to get out widely into the public. Okay, from Yvonne, um, Professor Mensa, thank you so much for your evidence-based presentation. Could you please comment further on the influences of Rawlsian liberal philosophy and how it underpins and permeates our liberal policy making such that even with the current knowledge of the intersection of health management policies, we see the deleterious impact for people of black African ancestry in the global African uh, diaspora. What new influences, actions can be brought to bear to make policy changes? So that question, uh, may I know? Repeat it's Yvonne, it. um, from Yvonne at 116, it's in the chat. If you'd like to take a look and read yeah, it. Let me just see, because the question is uh, deep and I need to. Uh, Yvonne Simpson at 115, at 116. 116, 116 in terms of time, right? Hmm. Yep. Uh, 116, 115, I've seen 116. Okay, now, thank you for your, okay, now. Mm -hmm. Could you further on influence of Russian liberal philosophy and how it underpins the premise of our liberal policy making such that even with the current, the current knowledge of intersection of health management policy, we see the direct part of people of African ancestors in the global African guys what new policies influence action you see um to be frank globally um, I like I like your angle of the global uh, analysis as a geographer globally you have this situation where uh, there is a global political economy that is racialized Okay, so as we are talking about Canada, it's not only Canada, it's just a situation where the whole globe is racialized in a way that tends to go against blacks in particular. That is not to say that other minorities are not affected. You go to US recently, just yesterday, they were talking about discrimination against Chinese because of the president talking about China virus and a lot of people are discriminated. But then you go to China, they are a great discrimination against Africans. You go here. So it is just the global dynamic has to be uh, upended in a way. Uh, to, to, I think it also comes to education and the whole idea of power dynamics and Africans may be trying to 
limit our dependency on the West on, uh, in a way, okay? And uh, some form of African unity, speaking on one voice and doing a whole bunch of things. Because globally, the image that has been created is no good and we have not been fortified enough in terms of counting, coming together to speak out in our policy. So I think the policy dynamic, I would say it has to start from say the African Union or the African side or the minority side. We cannot always expect it to come from uh, the other. You have to remember now some Africans are getting into key positions of power. Only two days ago, the Nigerian foreign minister has been elected to be the head of the WTO foreign side. If you go to the WHO, who? The leading person there is uh, Tedro uh, Geba Jesus, who is an Ethiopian. Uh, okay, so we people are positioning themselves. You can tap into those type of resources. But what I'm trying to say is that the idea of policy coming from below up from the African continent, you have to pay more attention to it. At the end of the day, people tend to be looking out for their interests and we also have to. Okay, um, I'm just looking through the questions. I think many of the questions you've answered through your presentation and in your, in your Q and A as well. There's one about intergenerational homes. Mm -hmm. um, can you please speak from Jelifak? Can you please speak about intergenerational homes in the context of minorities in Canada? This seems to be also one of the factors of high numbers among blacks and other minority groups in the US. Perfect, this is a very, very important aspect. As we are talking about minorities and their exposure to COVID risk, keep in mind, if it is in Toronto, mostly it's black population. Go to uh, Manitoba or the Prairie Province, it's mostly the Aboriginal population that are being infected. That is the data. You go to far west, Vancouver, British Columbia, the bulk of the data in terms of minority will be Asian, Indians, in, in say Surrey or things like that. So it all depends on the space and the context and where the population is. Most of these populations uh, have intergenerational homes. In a way, it is helpful to us. In a way, it is not helpful to us. You have to take it this way. It is, you see how the COVID is affecting people in the elderly homes. The minority population don't have many people in the elderly home. So that's positive. Much the same way we have the intergenerational in the home, creating a lot of congestion and social distancing problem that we have to deal with. So in actual fact, the, the intergenerational setting, whereby you have the grandparents, you have the mom, you have the children, they are all in the household, feeds into the, the COVID risk. And that is something that we have to pay attention to. In fact, you may be at home, the elderly person may be at home, he or she is not going anywhere, but the young boy is going to work to say uh, Amazon or some delivery and it comes back and all of a sudden, boom, it affects everybody. Okay. Okay, um, we have a question from Tanya. Uh, thank you for your great lecture. Um, and she has a question, question about representation. How do you think the media has covered the issue of black and racialized communities? So far, as far as I can tell, it's difficult to see whether there have been any negativity in the Canadian context. Uh, to be frank, when the COVID hit first, I was in Guyana and that uh, Toronto star interviewed me there. In fact, anybody who wants that can Google it and find out that they wanted to know what is happening in Ghana. And I came in late here. So I've not been nested much into the, the discourse. I mean, besides the academic paper, the real public discussion on TV, some things like that. But so far, I don't think there have been any type of uh, st stigmatization much in here. But of course, People who are racist are racist and they will do it, okay, be against black or uh, Asian or whatever. But uh, so far, I don't think it's a big problem, at least as far as I can tell. Um, my, my take is a bit limited because of uh, the way I just got in here. Mm. Um, so some real question related to vaccines and some resistance. And I've also read articles about how um, many in the black community are sort of, um, distrustful or are a little resistant to getting the vaccine due to a lot of the sort of the, the experiments that we've seen throughout history, right? Um, and yep. the distrust in this insert of the system. What would you say about that? Again, as we were talking about, I think we need to educate a lot more people. Uh, those who are in position of power, 
that are taking it has to make it public that they themselves are taking it. It is something like that has to uh, be publicized a lot. Uh, I think that will help. And the black population has to be educated more because ultimately, I think if this hesitancy continue, it will be a situation where uh, a major uh, bulk of the black population will not be. Now, you have to remember the vaccine, uh, the WH uh, Director General, the Ethiopian guy, he just came up and talked about the fact that the world is at the brink of a mula, a mo, a, a mora fe, failure, catastrophic mora failure. That is it as well. Guess what? The 39 million vaccines have been uh, injected or <laughs> disseminated in the, in the advanced country, 49 countries. But he was talking about one, up, one country in the lowest, uh, lowest end having 25, not 25,000, not 2,500, 25. Okay, so using that, he was talking about catastrophic moral, uh, moral failure. So there is that. They don't have it, and if they have it, some are hesitant to take it. So we have a lot of things to, to, to do in terms of education. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, it's 1.30. Uh, I think we'll end it here. I, uh, yeah. I think some of the remaining questions, I believe you answered them earlier or through your, um, through your presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, from around the world. Thank you, Professor Mensa. This was very informative and I think um, information that we all needed to hear um, as well as many others <laughs> need to hear. Um, would you like to say anything sort of to wrap up? Yeah, all I would say is thank you, Anne, Susan, Chantal, Gertrude, and all my friends and family from Ghana, I can't mention everybody's name, but having about 200 people and a, and a Zoom talk like this is just impressive and humbling. And I appreciate you all. Uh, I don't want to single people out, but Mariam, I can see you here. If I, hey, I can see Asaro here, there are so many people, I'm so excited, but it's good to see you all. Hey, Vivian, I can see you there. So thank you all. And, <laughs> You say the YouTube with people. Thank you. Yes, yes for sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Hey, Joe. Joe, well done. Joe, well done. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.